What does it take to make workshops work? And how can we facilitate collaboration that sticks and leads to results? My name is Miriam Hapness, and with the Workshops Work podcast, I'm on the mission to help you to make workshops work by finding the magic ingredients. Today with me on the show is Markus Pittman. He is a facilitator, a coach, and a photographer. And we are having a conversation about learnings from photography on facilitation, how to use pictures and stock photography in your working sessions. So stay tuned. And by the way, if you don't have pen and paper at hand, don't worry. Visit workshops.work, check out for episode 49, and simply download my notes. So now, lean back and enjoy the show. Hello, Marcus. Welcome on the show. Good morning. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to discuss with you the link between photography, facilitation, and coaching. Oh, that's great. Because you're wearing several hats yes. and you're using photography and photos in your mm -hmm. facilitation technique. And I think there mm -hmm. are a lot of things we can learn from you. Thanks. And maybe we can just start with a short introduction of yourself. When was it that you start calling yourself a facilitator? Well, that took a, that was a long journey. I started, I think, well, what was it? 20, 25 years ago with a bank apprenticeship. Uh, mm -hmm. Then I've studied economics and IT. And then I realized in my first profession that uh, projects fail because of uh, people and mm -hmm. uh, not the Excel sheets that you tick. Have you done this? Have you done that? But of the people that don't uh, link so much with each other yeah. because of hidden agenda, because of conscious or unconscious processes that, that work in the, in, under the surface. So I started with the with some training courses, um, starting with NLP, some systemic coaching. And then I came across an approach that is called process-oriented psychology. Mm -hmm. And there I did a course that was called uh, Facilitator in Integrative Leadership. Mm -hmm. And that's the time where it, start, where it all starts because it, it has everything in there that mm -hmm. uh, as a facilitator you would need. Uh, facilitator is, is more or less an attitude to me can describe it with methods, but it's more attitude than methods. Uh, leadership, because you also have to take a lead in the role of the facilitator in, in processes. Mm -hmm. And integrative, because you have so many different opinions that all want to be integrated with each other and not marginalize one or the other. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, I think that was in 2005, 2006 oh. that, uh, that I've done it. Yeah. Since then, I'm, I'm using this word for me saying I'm a facilitator. So after all these different trainings and linking it back to the initial trigger that got you there, how do you now see the role of a facilitator to help projects succeed? Hmm, that is not so easy to answer. How do, can you repeat this question? Say that again. So you said that you realized or you started your facilitation journey because mm. you realized that projects fail because of people and not because no. of Excel sheets. Yes. So after all these trainings and your experience as a facilitator now, yeah. how do you see the role of a facilitator to save these projects? I think it's um, when, when I'm called, um, I mean, I could talk because I did so many different roles in organizations like a project manager, like a product manager, change manager, all these things. I could mm -hmm. talk about content. But at the end of the day, it's more the question of do people understand each other in the way they want it to be understood? And this is what I'm always focusing on. Are you understanding what he or she is going to say? And are you, I mean do you listen properly enough so mm -hmm. that you can understand and do you explain good enough so that he or she can understand what you want to say? Mm -hmm. So I'm more a translator of the two worlds. And, um, and that's coming back to my university degree in IT and economics as well, because mm -hmm. I was a translator in IT and economics. So I had to mm -hmm. understand both sides. And now I have to understand the one person, the other person and translate. That's the, I mean, this is my main job. I think that I do translate between awesome. the people. Yeah. And this immediately brings your other head, the photography, to my mind, mm -hmm. which is also, at least that's how I understand it, kind of a translation mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. words into pictures. It's also what I understood from my show with Sam on visual mm -hmm. facilitation. Right. 
So how do you understand the role of photography in facilitation? I mean, since 2008, I'm a freelancer under the umbrella of Impulse Raum. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and when I was designing this brand, I was thinking of, so why do I love photography? Why do I love a uh, companion uh, of people in, in those uh, workshops? And um, in Germany, you at least in Germany, the old school Germany, it, it always says, um, well, you only have to be one to be good. Uh, <laughs> but I realized, um, so could I say I'm a photographer? Can I say I'm a facilitator or a team coach or a coach? Do I have to be one or the other? So then I said, no, I'm, well, I'm not one or the other. What I do is bringing the topics to the surface and that's my speciality. Mm. So linking this together, I said, how can I make use of photography in those kind of processes? Because photography, I mean, if I see pictures or phot photographs, I get emotionalized by them. Mm -hmm. So, and my question, my leading question was, can I use pictures so that we come faster to the topics that want to be discussed in, in the workshop with the help of these pictures? So then I said, yeah, why not? Um, I call this process photography, not exactly understanding what I mean by that, um, but I did okay. a process oriented psychology <laughs> training. So I said, it has to be something with process. It has to be something with photography. So I created that word um, for me. And the vision that I had at that time was, can I take pictures of group processes like visual facilitators also do, but, um, mm -hmm. but in, a diff in, in another way, because I take pictures of things that are not being said, mm -hmm. whereas I think the visual facilitators, uh, as long as I understand and, and I, as I know them, they can write down words that, that people say which I can't take pictures of. That's a big uh, advantage of uh, graphic facilitators or visual facilitators because in, in photography, you only have non-spoken words. Mm -hmm. So that was my idea to, to photograph those kind of processes and then bring them into the process to emotionalize uh, leading questions that this group wants to work on, like what does the picture say about communication, the culture that we have, Dot, dot, dot. So it, it mm -hmm. depends on the process itself. So then I said, well, there is no one method. There is no one process photography approach. It always has to be linked to the group, the purpose of the workshop, the members that are in there, what you want to reach or what do, what do you focus on? What do you, what do you target on? Mm -hmm. So, but I think pictures, they let people talk about things that consciously they wouldn't have spoken about. Mm. I have the impression that especially comparing the photography to the visual facili um, facilitation mm. on the graphic recording. So from what I learned from Sam is mm. that he does have the option to record the unsaid mm -hmm. because he has some degrees of freedom to interpret right. the room and yeah. to visualize feelings, emotions. Mm -hmm. Whereas the photography, you can only take pictures of reality of what really mm -hmm. is. So I can right. imagine that it can be quite brute from mm -hmm. time to time because very often we're not aware of our body posture, for instance, mm -hmm. or the distance when we speak mm -hmm. body mm -hmm. language. Mm -hmm. What is your experience with that? My first idea when I started with this uh, process photography was I cannot take pictures and, and uh, facilitating the process at the same time. So mm -hmm. I always need a facilitator that I support with the process photography. Mm -hmm. Then I came into the process myself, uh, reflecting on, so how do I want to make use of the pictures in the process? And then I realized that some people had the idea that they can say, ah, you see, these two are in this kind of body language, so they don't understand each other. Mm. It's not what I want with this photography. It's not like, ah, now I caught you in a specific moment, and now we know that you don't like each other. <laughs> it's not what I want. So mm -hmm. I said, I can't hand over it to someone who is attitude-wise, someone who uses them like this. Mm -hmm. So after taking the pictures, I am a co-facilitator of the process. Now, if you see a picture where people are in a distant to each other, I would then say, Miriam, so what is it that you can see it? And where else can you see this in the way we work with each other? Mm. See, I want to get away from the concrete picture, 
but talking about the topic that you can see because it resonates with you. Someone else might see, oh, people are totally relaxed. Some other people might see, well, they don't like each other. So whether they are right or wrong is not my question, mm -hmm. but that you can see it, that is my question because it resonates with something you uh, experience in this organization. So and I think mm -hmm. this attitude is something that I'm really, really careful of because uh, otherwise I can't, I can't use these pictures in that, in that way. Yeah, I totally see your point. Mm. Would this mean though, so I try to imagine how this would work and... I wonder whether it's your role as the process photographer mm. would rather be to take the pictures on spot and then you have a screen where you show them immediately depending on the moment or mm. whereas it's something in the background like in a visual facilitation or are mm. the pictures something that you would do as a preparation beforehand and then have them as a topic for discussion during the actual workshop? Everything that you say, <laughs> it really depends. Now, if mm -hmm. now imagine you are the facilitator of a group process and mm -hmm. you say, I have this topic, I have this purpose, I have these participants, um, we want to talk about ABC. Mm -hmm. In my mind, there is an ideal process, like I could do them up front so that you give me time to walk through the office building, take some pictures of the office building, but it is, it's depending on the purpose of the workshop. Mm -hmm. And then we use them at the start of a workshop, could be an option. Other option would be I take pictures during your facilitation of the process. And best would be we have a night in between mm -hmm. when we use the, the pictures uh, because then we both can reflect on, so what did you see, feel, and hear during the day? Mm -hmm. uh, what did I see, feel, and hear? And which pictures might help us in the process? What can we see in the process? Um, I mean, it's just a hypothesis that we can build on. Yeah. But some pictures might not be good to use the next day. Some pictures might be perfect using, to use mm -hmm. the next day. And then uh, there is still the openness on we never know what people might say to that. Yeah. See, so you have makes, to be yeah. able to, to deal with very, very open processes. And mm -hmm. whatever comes, you have to be comfortable feeling, I mean, you have to feel comfortable in dealing with the situation. Whatever happens is the right thing that can happen. Yeah. And I do understand that it makes sense to have a night in between because then mm. you have the first day to yeah. also build the trust. Yes. Because I talk to a lot of facilitators about the use of image cards. Mm -hmm. So these would either be drawings, kind of a little yeah. bit like icon-like, yeah. yeah. or just stock photography. Yes. And what always came out of these conversations is that for a participant, it's easier to talk about a piece of art or an image that is abstract mm. than mm -hmm. to talk about themselves. That's mm -hmm. why conversations in museums are so mm. easy. Absolutely. So um, what are the pros and cons? Yeah, it's, uh, if you ask me whether any client ever wanted to have me taking pictures of a group process and using them for an intervention, mm -hmm. uh, the answer is very, very rarely. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was wondering, why is that? Yeah. And a lot of customers are very afraid of what is going to happen because of the, we have the need for um, control and yeah. orientation. You totally don't have any control and any orientation when using those kind of pictures in a group processes and a lot of customers don't want to deal with this. So that's why I step back for emphasizing on use this for workshops. I'm mm -hmm. using stock photographies. I have my own stock of photographies that I print out and that I use in my workshops now because it's not about I want to take pictures of a process. It's, it's more about... I want to emotionalize the people so that they start talking about things they wouldn't have said before so that we can mm -hmm. be very open and honest with each other and building the trust that we need for the process. That's my intent. Yeah. So not the method is, is important, but the intention to, to reach the, the, the objective of open and honest conversation and open and honest re relationships in, in, the, in, the, in the team. Totally. So whether you use art or not art or street photography, well, I'm a photographer. That's why I like street photography mm -hmm. um, using in my workshops from, from the spots I've been to because I'm not a draw. I, I can't draw. I, I'm, <laughs> and I'm, um, I want to use my own stuff. That's why I started with these photographies. 
So what do you think in general is the difference talking about a photograph, whether it's a stock mm. or a real one um, mm. or on the spot one compared mm. to more abstract art? You mean art like drawings or, abs I mean, really? Yeah, like real these art? image cards, like emoticons or like these ah. Dixit cards yeah. that I personally use in my workshops. Yeah, I personally don't like them that much. Mm -hmm. It's just a preference. I can't say whether they work, yes or no. There are people that work better with these emoticons. Mm -hmm. There are people that work better with photography. I sometimes have customers that, that don't know what to say when they see a picture, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, I prefer this. And um, I can't say whether this one works better than the other one. It's just, um, if you believe that that works, it works. Yeah. According to you, that avoids your some of your clients to be able to express their thoughts or feelings when they see a picture. How can I say that in English? I mean, yes, you see a picture, but what, what should I do with the picture? This is a question that they have. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. know. I mean, what do you want from me? So It's, what do I you mean, ask them to do are, with the picture? Yeah, what do you want me to, to say? I can't see anything in this picture. I don't know what the meaning of the question is that you ask me. This method is nothing for me. Mm -hmm. And what would be an example of a question that you would ask along with a picture? Well, it depends on, on the sequence I use it in. Mm -hmm. If I use it for an opening sequence, I would ask, the, so how does this picture reflect on your actual situation? Mm. Could be one question. What I do, talking about methods and how to use the pictures, yeah. I would say, please pick one, two or three images for whatever reason catches your attention. I don't mm -hmm. give you any questions with it. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to have this uh, say, <laughs> because I think you speak faster than you think. So, mm -hmm. but what you say is more honestly. So that's why I don't give you the questions. Mm -hmm. Also, if I choose the, because choosing the right question in the beginning is key for the rest of the process. So if customers ask me, what are the questions that you ask? I say, hmm, these are examples. But if I see the group, if I, if I say hello to the group, I might change the question on the spot. Mm. Might be. So, Can you give an example? The question that I ask is, yeah. how does this picture reflect your actual situation? Mm -hmm. It's an, would more or less an easy one. The other one could be, so what compliment does this picture have for you? Mm. And the third one could be, what will you take care of to make this workshop a success? Interesting. And what would be a situation that triggers you to change your question? Or maybe an example when you walked into the room and like, no, this group needs a different question to select their picture. Personally, uh, or style-wise, I'm, I'm a high-risk person in, mm -hmm. in workshops. High-risk meaning, I also, I mean, you know the, the, the tool of a timeline, right? The highlights and the lowlights of the past three years. Mm -hmm. I think this is something that you exchange probably more or less at the later stage of a workshop, but I do it right after the introduction round. Wow. So it's sometimes mm -hmm. very, very early. If it works perfect, then I have a very open workshop for the rest of the day or the two mm -hmm. days. If it doesn't work, I have some rework to do <laughs> uh, or <laughs> it is not that intense. So, yeah. but this is the trust I have in the process. But if I, because you asked for the trigger, if I have the feeling that there is so much room, I mean, so much potential for conflict in the room so much mm -hmm. why am i here what is this all about i should be on my desk i don't have time mm -hmm. for this nonsense then i might change the questions to a more easy one or i would say if if you're like this now it's it's a little bit uh, freestyle now i would say so what could be a good reason to be here mm. how can you make best use of your time being here mm -hmm. and not using the door and going to the desk yeah Might I guess that that's where your coaching questions. experience comes in, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I, what I always like to do, I think this is also one, one guiding principle with me to emphasize the uh, self-responsibility. Mm -hmm. You chose to be here. No, my boss told me to be here. I said, but you could say, yeah, no, if you're willing to pay the price. So there's mm -hmm. a reason why you are here. So make use of the time. Yeah. So what would be your approach then? Assuming that you have a group where you can feel that actually they don't want to be there for one reason or another, 
Mm. And it can, I guess, in most of the times, it has nothing to do with the workshop itself, but just with the workload and what's going on outside. So how would you get them into a more relaxed or more open-minded? Well, something that I also also have in mind is the, uh, then it comes to my mind this, uh, this connect thing. Uh, so I have mm. to connect to the people who are in the room. I have to connect to the topic and I have to commit being here. Mm. I somehow have to make this work. I can't say how I do it all the time, but introduction round is very, very important that everybody has the chance to speak out loud. Mm -hmm. I very much care for the first person speaking because they set the benchmark for the rest. Mm. So if I have three questions and people say yes, yes, no, then the rest would say yes, yes, no as well. So the first person has, <laughs> has to speak a little bit more so that the rest of the group speaks more. So would you then consciously choose the person you address no. as a first speaker or you just I don't know the better. persons that, that come into the room normally uh, mm -hmm. um, except, except I had an interview phase up front or diagnosis mm -hmm. phase up front usually I don't know that so I always say who feels to speak first speaks mm -hmm. so and this person has to speak a little longer because it's the benchmark for the rest yeah would you tell them that no Some, it depends. <laughs> I think I would say, I mean, if you give me a, if you are the, imagine you are the first speaking and give me mm -hmm. short answers. Mm -hmm. It depends on my intuition and, and uh, what I would say. I would rather say, Miriam, could you say a little bit more to this question, to that question, mm -hmm. anything more to say? Or I might say, see, you set the benchmark for the rest of the group. If you don't speak too much, the rest will not speak so much. Mm -hmm. So please, so this gives a little bit like, um, it depends on how open and honest, I, I mean, I want to be with the group as well. No, it really depends on, if I get the impression that they don't talk too much to each other, then I would use this, I think. Mm -hmm. If I don't feel this that much, I would just ask questions to you. Or I would ask the group, do you have any questions for Miriam? Yeah. Okay. Regarding this question. So especially if the group is more or less not in real contact with each other, Yeah. I, would, I would spend a lot of time in the introduction round. And for that, the pictures as well. The pictures help as well to speak about things because they make you say things that you might not say if it could just give you a question. Mm. Because then again, people would rather speak about the picture than about themselves. They speak about themselves anyway. Yeah, but through the picture. <laughs> That's <laughs> better. It does, this is just a vehicle. I mean, I have a picture that I show into the camera now. You can see it. Perhaps you, you might see Which it. It looks like a big river and boys jumping into the river to swim from a little right. wooden island. Yeah. See, now you say wooden, I yeah, wooden island. That's what you see. Right. And what you see is what you see. Some yeah. people say, did you take this picture in Germany or did you take it in UK? Where did you? It doesn't matter. Mm. It doesn't, it's just important what it reminds you of. Yeah. It doesn't matter. If mm -hmm. people open up, I have a good basis for the rest of the workshop. Yeah. So your background in photography, you learn mm. to see the world through a lens, literally. Mm. So what have you learned about facilitation or coaching from your other career as a photographer? Mm. I started with travel photography, but that was not my real, I mean, experience that I made for workshops. My, my biggest experience came from wedding photography. Mm. Mm -hmm. Because Thank you. I, I would say, how to say that, why do I like weddings? I like it because in the moment you say yes to your husband or to your wife, it's unconditional. So it's an unconditional yes that you say. And it is the yes to say now two families grow together. And this, so to say, reference emotion that I feel when I'm on a wedding, mm -hmm. I know how it feels if you say unconditionally yes. And if I have the same feeling in a team coaching or a team process where people say yes to each other, I feel it in a, and then I know we are on the right spot. So I think that's what I've learned a lot It's more the reference feeling that I came, got back from, from weddings. I and know how it feels and now to say unconditionally yes. And is it also the, because when you said that you learned a lot from wedding photography, mm. I do like your example with the unconditional yes. Mm -hmm. And still wonder whether it's also this genuine 
or sometimes maybe not so genuine environment at a wedding because very often there's a lot of unsaid. So maybe there's an ex that is amongst the guests that nobody knows of. Maybe there are some family tensions. Maybe the mother-in-law was actually not happy. Maybe there's a child in the belly that nobody should know about. Right. So I had all these things in mind when you referenced if, wedding if photography. People ask me, so, I mean, I sometimes say I have to solve two problems on a shooting. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter whether it is a wedding or uh, whatever it is, whether it is a portrait shooting as well. I have to solve two problems. One is light, lightning, mm -hmm. and the other is the social. So if business partners want to be photographed, they come into the room. I don't know where they come from. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they talked about in the car getting here. So... I have to have a good feeling for social social situations as well. So in, in photographies, uh, I mean, in my photography work, I train this a lot, apart from the workshops that you have. I mean, if you do workshops, you have the same, you have to also solve these social issues. You don't have yeah. the lightning issues. You might have other issues like, is the material the right thing? Uh, do we get the good food? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. All these things, but you have to take care. And on a wedding, I don't know how many, I mean, uh, the feedback that I got from the wedding is, You supported uh, our ceremony. You supported our wedding with the with the way you are as a person. Because a photographer can destroy a, a, a complete wedding mm. if you have the wrong person. In what set. way? Uh, the way you talk, the way you act with the people, the way you... Every supporter mm. of a wedding is an intervention of, of this event. And can be a distraction, so, yeah. The way I dress, the way I speak, the way I'm in the church, for example, if it is in a church, uh, am I the focus of the people or is the couple the focus of the people? Uh, mm. All these things, yeah, you can destroy it totally. I think I'm the only one on a wedding who knows almost everything of the people, if you're close to the people. So I know parents don't like that her daughter marries this man. I know that wife, I mean, father and, and uh, mother of the couple uh, are like this and that. I mean, you are so close to the people. Mm -hmm. And so in the way I act and interlink with, each, uh, with the people, with each other, give information from one side to the other side, I, I have a big influence on the wedding. Hi, this is Andrew. I'm a facilitator and head of customer success at Session Lab, the dynamic workshop planner tool. More than 30,000 facilitators, trainers, and coaches use our workshop planner tool and save time and effort in the design process. So, how do they do it? Our drag-and-drop agenda builder makes it easy to transform your ideas into high-quality workshops, and the timing of your agenda automatically updates when you make changes. You can collaborate in real time with your colleagues and easily share professional-looking printouts with your clients. And if you need inspiration, you can check out our library of more than 500 activities and exercises and simply drag the ones you need right into your workshop agenda. So check out Session Lab to save time and effort in your workshop design process. And now get your first two months of Session Lab Pro absolutely free at sessionlab.com forward slash workshops work. And I could relate so many times to actually the role of a facilitator when you just... Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Described it because a facilitator yeah. also doesn't want to catch the attention. The attention mm -hmm. should always be the group, mm -hmm. must be the group and not the facilitator. And still you can either support the process or you can disrupt, disturb the process, depending Absolutely. on how you dress, how you act, how you listen. Absolutely. Yeah. Totally. And I think in that way, my profession as a facilitator helped me in the wedding photography on the other side as well. Mm -hmm. And the wedding photography helped me to better understand group dynamics, feelings, emotions that are in the air or not. Would you use facilitation or coaching tricks when you have a photography gig? And if so, what? I'm stopping with wedding photography right now, um, but I do portrait uh, work. Mm -hmm. So if you want to have a portrait taken with me, it's more a coaching process as well. And the picture is thus just the result of a good facilitation or a coaching process. Mm -hmm. Because I ask you questions like, so Miriam, who are you? Um, what do you want to see and feel if you see your future pictures? What do your customers 
should they feel and see when they see the pictures? What specific of your personality do you want to show with the picture? Mm -hmm. And what's your specific style as a facilitator that no one else can present like you? Because there are so many facilitators and coaches out there, but who are you? Mm -hmm. So this is when I take pictures, it's, it's a coaching process. So this means that you find out everything about the person you shoot on the spot or would you have kind of an intake questionnaire? Mm -hmm. I have a questionnaire that I send. I mean, imagine again, you would be the, my next customer and you say yes to the process and you want to have pictures taken. Then I would say I send you four or five questions. I don't want to have clear answers to these questions. I just want you to think about these questions mm. so that you are not shocked when I ask you those questions on set. And I think And um, last time I had a, a manager and she used this process of, take, of, of this portrait to reflect on her leadership style and in her role as a managing director and in her role as a coach and a mentor for people that she's leading. Before the shoot, she had a slide with, this is my university degree, this is my experience in this job, this job, this. After the shoot, she has a picture of herself in the middle and then some keywords and that's it. So she used this process of, of, of this portrait to really change her introduction of herself. And suddenly your buzzword process photography gets an mm -hmm. entire new edge Absolutely. Yeah. Where it's more of a coaching session. Would this yes. be your hashtag or what hashtag would you choose for yourself? Uh, my hashtag would be open, honest, open mm -hmm. and honest. I think courageous or courage, mm -hmm. I think is very important, authentic. And I don't know what to say. I mean, inspired, inspiration, being inspired. I think this is also very mm -hmm. important. Yeah. Say yes to yourself, whatever it is. Everybody is, uh, is perfect as they are. They just have to see it. Yeah, and to be able to show it or to have someone who, mm -hmm. who puts it um, forth. And yeah. I'm intrigued by this process photography where you <laughs> use it as a coaching or where you use coaching in order to take the best picture. Because again, yeah. once you get the people to reflect on it, then they, will, they might adjust how they dress, how they show up, whether they yeah. wear glasses or not and with what right. kind of mindset. Absolutely. And before, if I remember correctly, you said that you, when you walk into a workshop space, you don't mm. know anything about the participants. Mm -hmm. Have you ever considered using the same approach for your workshops where you send participants a survey to put them into a certain mindset? You mean uh, to take pictures of them or portraits? Not even, but just sending them the survey and asking them some questions ah, to right. reflect upon. No, this is something I want to try out this year. I think I uh, send them a video message or something oh. uh, with some key questions up front. Mm -hmm. This is something I want to try this year, whether this is an add on yes or no for, mm -hmm. for my customers and for the workshop participants yeah, so that they can see me up front because they, they Google me and yeah. then they see, Oh, he's a portrait photographer or he's a facilitator. He's a coach who is coming. What mm. is that person? I mean, who is it? <laughs> so, yeah. So that could also uh, give, uh, give a good connect up front, sending you a, a video message. Yeah. And it's funny that you mentioned uh, the photographs, whether I assume that you could take pictures of the participants beforehand. Yeah, but this is uh, cost expense uh, intensive yeah. for, for customers. And um, for the workshop, it's not necessary. Yeah. I see uh, that I get maybe a, for I, leadership, I Sorry? leadership, maybe for a leadership training program where you then prepare them to yeah. group pictures where Absolutely. they represent yeah. the company. What I do is for group dynamics as well, if you ask me how to use photography, um, if they want to have a group picture taken from them or of them, mm -hmm. I say, yeah, I'm a photographer. I could, I could pose you in the best way, but since this is a workshop and a team workshop, uh, do it yourself. So here's the camera on a tripod. I just press one or two times on the, uh, on the button, mm -hmm. but you have to decide on how you want to present you as a leadership team. Mm. So that starts a discussion amongst them and, and opens up the group dynamics as well. 
This is very interesting. Because I don't want to have a perfect picture taken by a star photographer. I want to have a picture that they say, this is us. Yeah. So they have to get into contact with each other and talk about what is the best way to present ourselves. And would you and facilitate this conversation or would you leave it open to them and trust that they will figure it out? Because I can imagine yeah. that there's a lot of tension that might come up and a lot mm -hmm. of decision. It's a deep conversation. Absolutely. I don't do it at the start of a workshop. It's more or less at the end of the workshop. Mm -hmm. So they have gained a lot of experience with each other already. So they open up already. Mm -hmm. I like to step out of this process because then there is no interference with me and I'm not influencing this process because mm -hmm. it should only be about them. Yeah. So I, I step back. I leave them alone with the question. Thank I have to you. be able to hold this space. And also if they say, what a stupid task you gave us. Oh, this no. tension is, I mean, I have to hold it. Yeah. Okay. You know, this, you shock the people with, with the next assignment. There's the shock. Nobody moves. And this pause, you have to hold it. Yeah, totally. Because if then you move, I think the slightest sign of doubt in yourself, mm -hmm. they will catch it and they will jump Absolutely. on it and find an excuse to break out of this discomfort. And then you lost. Yeah. Yes. That's why this word leadership is so important. Facil uh, in facilitate an integrative leadership. You have to lead this process, even if yeah. you're not the important. I mean, you're not important, but important. Yeah. Yeah. You're not in the center. It reminds me of this book. Don't just do something, stand there. Mm -hmm. It's a weird title, but it's a fantastic book. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And what they basically say is that very often we, the facilitator must do less and mm -hmm. just trust that the group will come up with yeah. something. Absolutely. So just standing there yeah. with the discomfort and in mm -hmm. the silence Absolutely. will then force them implicitly or invite them, push them mm -hmm. to finally do something. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. What is your favorite exercise? Favorite exercises definitely are trust building exercises mm -hmm. where people start talking about themselves. So the introduction round with the pictures is, is key to me. The timeline is key to me. So highlights and lowlights of the past three years or highlights and lowlights of being a leader or being led mm -hmm. by someone because we want to talk about leadership, leadership styles and so on. Or timeline regarding if we talk about teamwork, it would be the same highlights and lowlight working in and with teams. And These when are, you say timeline, is it because they should pick something in a specific time of yes. their lives? Right. So the past three years or past five okay. years, for example, mm -hmm. or past 10 years depends. Yeah. And I would say these are events of the past. Highlights meaning you love to remember this moment. You are very proud of this moment. You, it was a fabulous moment for you. So mm -hmm. what was that? And lowlights is something that make you angry, sad, or even drove you mad. Mm. And if the group is too big, I would say everybody maximum of three mm -hmm. for highlights and lowlights because that takes a very long time. But if you once started this process, you can't stop it. Yeah. So it might take a really long time. But it's worth it for the people because they learn so much about each other. That is so much trust building for the rest of the process. So I assume this would be for a multi-day workshop. Yeah. If I have more than one day, yes. Yeah. yeah. If I only have one day, that, that exercise takes so long because we could almost be, depending on the number of people that are in the room, but we could be at lunchtime already after mm. the session. So there's not much. And once the participants open up, you don't want mm -hmm. to interrupt it and to risk right. this because yeah. this would take the safe space at risk, right? Absolutely. Have you ever, there's one question that just popped up in my mind. Have you ever asked participants to bring their own photographs to the session? Not photographs, but that could also be an option. I, I, uh, I said, bring an artifact with you mm. uh, that describes the culture of your family, the culture of the company, whatever it is. So we speak about these artifacts then. Yeah. What was the funniest artifact that you've seen in such a session? I can't say whether it is a funny one, but I once had an intercultural training group for, for leadership training and someone from Japan brought a mask with him and explained what this mask is all about in Japan. Mm. And with that, you learn so much about a culture. 
So it's more say? impressive what you can learn from people when they bring stuff uh, because you have stereotypes of, of different cultures. Yeah. And now that you have someone from the culture bringing an artifact of the culture, explaining what that means to him or her, that's so much, uh, so much interesting, so funny. I couldn't say funny. No, funny wouldn't be the right word for this. More interesting yeah. or yeah. inspiring as well. Imagine this person bringing the mask to describe the company mm. culture. <laughs> <laughs> this would be an entire different meaning, right? Abs absolutely, totally, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a nice way for a conversation trigger, yeah, on so many absolutely. different levels. Yeah, I want to get a conversation rolling or mm. I want to have a good conversation. So that's why you need some tools, so to say, to start the conversation, yeah. to have a good conversation. How does a failed workshop look for you? A failed workshop? I have some, f I mean, I have one big fail workshop. I only talk to the person who invited me for the workshop and not talking mm -hmm. to the key stakeholders in the workshop. I so missed this. Meaning that they are not invited? No, they were invited. They were there. But the person who invited me that I talked to, I trust that this person briefed the people of the workshop mm -hmm. good enough which he didn't. Mm. So briefing the participants up front regarding the workshop is key. Mm -hmm. I think cross-checking other participants, the right participants in the room mm -hmm. is key. I think first contact is key as well. So how do you, what's the choreography of the first contact that you have with people? So Are you standing in your room writing mm -hmm. flip charts, people coming into the room, you're not talking to the people. So the hosting yeah. Yeah. is... is so it's all in the beginning. Uh, if the beginning is perfect, so the preparation of the participants, the expectation management of the participants up front, the hosting of the room, mm -hmm. then you can make mistakes as a facilitator that the group says, ah, it's okay. Yeah, because you already gained their trust and they see yes. that you took care of them. Absolutely. I think it was Pam Hamilton who gave the example of hosting a dinner at home. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. that is similar to the facilitation. So mm -hmm. when you welcome the guest, you did the groceries and you know what you're going to cook. Mm -hmm. So you know all of these things and hopefully you're not in the middle of the cooking. Would you have an analogy between photography and the beginning of a workshop, mm -hmm. the hosting? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. When I, now talking about portrait photography, mm -hmm. I want to be ready when the customer enters the room my makeup artist is there and has laid out all the uh, makeup stuff. Mm -hmm. It's very important so that when the customer enters the room, two people are there to serve. Mm. So it's, it's very important, yeah. I switch off my telephone, no phone calls. It's in flight mode. So I want to be totally present for this one customer only. Yeah. No interference. I think this is also key for workshops. I always, always switch off my phone in workshops, always flight mode because then i can't receive any calls any whatsapps nothing can yeah. enter my process from outside the same would you request that from your participants as well no i think we are already there that people regulate themselves regarding this mm -hmm. i wouldn't set this rule because i think it's more or less common sense already that you switch it off Or if it really disturbs me, too. And what I say in the beginning is I give you a longer break so that you can deal with your uh, emails and your mm -hmm. telephone calls so that you can concentrate on the sessions that we have. This should be enough, I think, to say switch off the phones or put it away. Yeah. And I always wonder to what extent. So it, this is a conversation discussion that I have with myself. <laughs> Mm -hmm. To what extent I actually fear the competition of these devices so that I have to exclude them. Because if I trust that mm -hmm. my process and my workshop are interesting enough mm -hmm. so that participants don't even want to look at their devices, mm -hmm. then I don't need to make a rule for that because right. then it becomes common sense. The moment where someone in the room feels the urge to check their phone, go on WhatsApp or mm -hmm. LinkedIn, maybe I'm not providing enough value. Or the workshop is not, I mean, he's the right or wrong participant for the workshop. Yeah, true. This would be the less self-critic. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I but I think nowadays it is so present everywhere, these, these smartphones, that you can't say switch it off. And I think the young people that, that come 
now into the workshops, if you say, take it away, they say, I take notes on it. What do you want? Mm. So I'm more checking and cross-checking. Are you fully present in the process? Yes or no. If you are mm -hmm. not, it can also be because you draw on your paper yeah. uh, that True. you're not present. So this is more uh, important to me. So if one, someone is, is, is writing emails or whatever he or she does on the phone and is still present in the workshop, why should I bother? Yeah, very true. Do you take pictures of the session just as a facilitator here and there yeah. to document? and? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But this is only the nice pictures. I mean, I would also only circulate the nice pictures that show yeah. the atmosphere of the workshop Because you have the content, uh, I mean, everybody takes photo protocols, I guess, yeah, mm -hmm. flip charts, taking pictures of flip charts, but also taking pictures of the people. But I'm using only my iPhone for that, but then in a portrait mode. Uh, that makes a difference, yeah. <laughs> Because of the focal length and the, and the um, depth of field, yeah, the depth of field is important to me. That gives it more atmosphere to the picture. Yeah, That's a I, little um, trick. Yes, I, I figured that out only recently, actually. Yes. And Totally. Yeah. It's a game changer. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yay. Totally. Little yeah. nugget at the end. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Markus, is there anything that we haven't covered in our conversation that you wanted to share with the audience? No, I think it's everything is, uh, is, is very well uh, rounded, I think. Um, right? Perfectly. The only thing I want to say, if I may say, and, and if uh, these pictures, Because this is something I started end of last year. I start a platform now uh, calling Coaching Fundus. Mm -hmm. I think it was initiated also by your invitation to the, to the podcast mm -hmm. that I say now it's time to do it really because it was for a long time in my mind. I've done so many workshops already. So why mm -hmm. not sharing some of mini specs or so with, with the facilitators out there because the specs don't make the difference. You as a facilitator make a difference. Yes. And there are so many tools that work. So why not sharing? And on this platform I started, but I started this platform now with uh, giving the possibility to also buy these pictures that I use in my workshops. Uh, and I have two starter sets already set up. And uh, yeah, if you like, you can link to it in the podcast. Absolutely. Great idea. Yeah. I will put a link there and I will put a link to your LinkedIn profile and to Impulse Realm. Thank you very much. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Awesome. If someone fell asleep after minute one and doesn't mm -hmm. have time to listen to the entire show again, what would you like them to remember? Focus on open, honest conversation and building trust in the moment is key for a successful workshop. And how to do it, you could listen to this workshop, uh, to this podcast, and perhaps you, perhaps you find out some impulses for your next workshop. Yeah, and find some inspiration from photography. Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Markus. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure show. talking to you. Thank you. Have a good day. Have a Bye -bye. good day too. Bye. Thank you for staying tuned and listening to the show. I appreciate your attention as I know how busy you are. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and engage by sharing your comments and thoughts and visit workshops.org to download the one-page summary. I'm looking forward to seeing you back at the next episode and I wish you a fruitful day. Thank <laughs> you.